I want to talk a little bit about like what's the setup or motivation for this project. So the goal is that we are given a model. Well, let's maybe frame this as the setup. Okay, I'm going to write some things down. It's just a little bit of notation, and then I'll tell you what it means. We're going to have some function which takes uh, n real numbers as inputs, as independent variables. And it's some measurement of those numbers, so it outputs one real number. Um, and we'll denote this as something like f of x1, x2, dot 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 up to xn equals, well, maybe just y. And all I mean by this is that there are these in input variables into the function. What, is, what does that mean? You know, if we have our function black box like this, f, okay, well, it still just has one output, these y values, but now it has n many, uh, can't, right, so n is in undetermined numbers, we don't know how many there are. Um, but it has n many inputs. Maybe just drawing a copy of the, the real line here, but it kind of goes into it n times. Okay, zero, and then y is also something that lives as a real number. Um, and so what this means is like, the way I like to think about this is f is some measurement based on some number of explanatory variables. So like in, in my own you know, life, I uh, did sort of data science work for a fair, fair while. And the problem you would see with this kind of situation is like maybe you have a location somewhere in the United States and I don't know, maybe you're some big re retailer, some large coffee company or something and you want to, uh, Let's say you want to put down a new location in some new spot. Okay, and so you might have like a number of uh, variables you can measure at sort of all the spots in the US. Like it might be, I mean, two, two obvious ones might be like, what's the position in the US? What's the latitude and the longitude? So that would be two of these input variables. Um, but other things might be like, what's the, the population density at this exact location? Or um, I don't know, what is, what is the, the gender makeup? Or what is the um, what are the different like education levels or you know just sort of like all the things that you might put on like a, a census for example, these could all be, you know, millions and millions of input variables you can include in your model. <clears throat> and there's a separate separate question of like, okay, so which ones do you choose? We kind of ran into this issue in the last project of like, when you have the option of two explanatory variables, but somehow one of them is already explaining the other one. So that in this previous case, it was like temperature and altitude were two of the potential explanatory variables, but we knew they were already kind of linked. Um, so what's happening in this case is sort of similar. We have, you know, n many explanatory variables. We're taking some measurement of it. Um, in the case that, uh, like the physical situation I was talking about, it might have been, you know, latitude, longitude, um, a bunch of demographic information, and then the output would have been like some estimate for, say, the revenue that you might get at that location, uh, you know, a year after uh, building it or something. Um, so that's kind of like a, I don't know, an ec economic application. But you could also imagine this in the sciences, where like the output is is some some measurement, like an inch of Earth interval, but now it depends on maybe many more variables. Um, and the question we want to answer, or the, the goal question is, which x sub i has the most impact? So in my, in my situation that I worked in, the um, this was like a very common question. You know, you would go do some mathematics, you would build this huge mathematical model, which takes in all of these input variables and predicts their revenue. And the immediate next question they would ask would be like, okay, well, which variable do I change to increase revenue the most? 
right? Because that's you know, at the end of the day, it's it's you know a human or a business doing mathematics or something. Um, but you you might imagine this popping up in the sciences too. You know, if you cared about the interbirth interval and it depends on hundreds of variables, you might want to know well which one should we be paying attention to if we're like trying to preserve an ecosystem or something like that. Um, and which or sort of which one has the most impact? You know, if I change this temperature by a little, does it change the interval by a lot? And with, if that's the case, then maybe we need to be careful with what temperatures we put them in. Um, and okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, the answer is going to be the goal is to analyze this question. So I, I won't say that there's like an answer to it. It's, it's not so clear that, you know, one is the most impactful. But the idea is to somehow consider different combinations of variables, see how changing their inputs changes the outputs and do some kind of um, systematic analysis of this. So I want to set up what the actual physical situation is. So this should be on the handout if you want to follow along. Uh, starting in section four. And okay, so the setup is, it's another sort of biological situation. And this, this time we have, uh, so I wanna say this is pronounced zooplankton, but I'm not entirely sure. Maybe somebody, somebody can correct me if they know how it's actually pronounced. Um, but I guess the idea here is they go through um, some development sort of life cycle, which includes this embryonic and post embryonic stage. And uh, we're trying to measure this thing we're calling the generation time, which is somehow the total time it takes for them to uh, go through these, these uh, stages of their life cycle. Uh, we know that it depends on two things coming from um, some paper that did an analysis and found out that these were two explanatory variables, namely how much mass does this little zooplankton have? You can just go measure it, uh, weigh it on a scale. And also uh, the, this generation time depends on the temperature so you can imagine if you're incubating these things in a lab or something, then uh, you know you might incubate more over a fixed period of time if the temperature is higher or lower than room temperature or something. Okay, so these are coming from paper. So it's linking, I don't know how easy it is to see if I, okay. If I zoom in, so it's paper one in the reference. Um, you can sort of take a look at that if you want, but. It's not super important um, for the, the immediate setup that's following, but maybe important as you're writing up your project and want to, like if you're doing your introduction and your conclusion, you want to explain the physical situation, uh, you might read the abstract of that paper for, for some ideas. Okay. Um, so we know that the generation time depends on the body mass and the temperature. And we have this other uh, factor Right, so here, here's the problem is we want to predict this generation time, but it depends on two input variables. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe this is an okay time to draw a picture of this. Well, okay, I'll come back to this in a second. But um, all right, so the, the problem with this, as we saw um, in sort of the previous thing, is that if we had one equation that depended on two input variables, this is some surface in space. It was kind of difficult to reason about. So we tried to come up with a constraint equation. So we like have this surface and like intersect it with a, a plane or something and get some smaller, small dimensional surface that now we can do um, pre-calculus and algebra on. So it's quite the same idea here. We have this generation time, which is the thing we care about, but it depends on two variables, the body mass and the temperature. So we're going to go out and search now for some other equation because this equation depends on two variables. If we can find some other equation, which depends on the same two variables, then we have a system of two equations and two unknowns, and this is something we can solve. Um, or rather, it's like a, an objective and a constraint function. So we can bring it down to one variable. So the constraint we go out and find is this business about um, measuring the metabolic rate of these zooplankton. We find that it's also limited by body and temperature. That's kind of what we were looking for. And we have some equations that give us um, the generation time as a function of MNT and the metabolic rate as a function of MNT. And 
so at least that's that's the physical setup. Um, I want to say a little bit about how we're going to, to analyze this question. Um, so in our case, we have, let me make sure I use the same notation from last time. Uh, let's see what the actual, So I'll come back to the actual equation in a second. So I think I, I'm mostly going to be walking through the equations from the example. Um, it's because I don't want to give away too much of how to actually solve the equation for the, the first part, but I'll at least write it down for you guys so you can see um, how to start working with it. But okay, how are we going to analyze this question? We're going to consider the quantities Okay, so I'm going to use some notation here and then I will tell you what it means. Um, so this is what they're actually called. They're called the partial derivatives. So we have this function f, remember, which is depends on n input variables, x1 up through xn. And we're going to measure the partial derivative of f with respect to one of the x sub i's. Um, some people might if you've seen any differential calculus before, you might have seen this as like d, df, dx or something. Um, for our purposes, it'll suffice to consider these delta f's over delta x sub i's, which is maybe more familiar. This is more like a, a slope of a line or something. Um, but all this notation means is it's just a rate of change. A rate of change. It's not a fraction. Um, it's just this, this whole thing, I should put in quotes, just means something. This whole thing means something else. And what does it mean? Well, it means like take these small increments in f, take a small increment, so the f, um, uh, take a small increment in the output variables, take a small increment in the input variables, and just compare what these look like. And this is giving you some indication of like how important that variable is. Uh, if I change every x variable by one, right, so this is the like the marginal rate of change maybe mentioned a little earlier in the class, um, then I can just vary each parameter by one, like plus or minus one, and I can see how the outputs change. And you know, if, if I change the x parameter by one and the output changes by three, then this is just a number. It's three over one, three. If I change you know, a different x parameter and now it's the output changes by 10, um, and I change the x parameter by one, then this is just a number 10. And this is somehow saying that that variable is more important because I changed it by the same amount in the inputs, just plus or minus one, but it disproportionately affected uh, outputs. And so just to kind of give you an idea of like what this is supposed to um, look like, if you want to like geometrically interpret this, again, these part of the reason we're doing this kind of analysis is because these things are really hard to draw and think about in general. Um, the idea is we have, like we're used to living in this flat x, y plane. In the real world, we live in a three-dimensional sort of space. So we have, um, we can go out anywhere, um, uh, just forwards, backwards, left and right. But we can also potentially like move up and down. That's all this coordinate system is saying. And if we go out to some position here, something like this, a function f that depends on, so this is f of just two variables, x1, x2, and the z coordinate is now what's measuring, instead of the, the y's, the z coordinate is measuring the outputs. And I guess really I should call these, instead of x1 and x2, here we're just calling them x and y. And so now y is one of the input variables, and it's just a name. And if I go out and measure some function of my position that just outputs a real number, this is like walking out to this point here, I've drawn with the dotted lines, um, and looking up and measuring some height of like a ceiling above you. So what you get is some kind of, if I can actually draw this, 
Okay, that's not so bad. Okay, something like this. Uh, all right, not the, the most amazing drawing in the world, but uh, you can imagine this is like a, a blanket or a sheet or something kind of suspended up in space. And you go out to this position, you go up, you find the point on the space that corresponds to that point uh, downstairs. And so what we're doing here is, let's say we want to consider first uh, D, F, Sorry, let me actually change this labeling, labeling a little bit. This is equals f of x, y. This blanket thing in space is literally the graph of a function. So it's the exact same kind of graph we've been looking at in the rest of class, where you know we graph it on the plane. This is just how graphs generalize to higher dimensions. Um, what we're looking at here is let's look at df dx. And all this is saying is that if I move a little bit in the x direction, say one unit, here I've drawn it as two, uh, two grid points. Well, I go up and so I've just changed the x. I haven't actually changed the, um, the y coordinate. So remember, y is the one that's kind of pointing back into the page. So I go up and look on the surface, and I get some different point here. And I get some little uh, difference in x values, right? So maybe I've changed this from x0, x1. And here, this is just going to be f of, sorry, maybe this is uh, y0 over here. We'll consider a y1 in a minute. Okay, so there's a df. It's going to be x0 and y0. It's going to be minus f of that x1, y0, over x1 minus x0. So the thing to notice here is that I, I kept the, the y value of it constant. It's just the same y naught, and I'm only changing the x direction. So I said I have this big complicated thing, and I'm just going to analyze it one variable at a time by just changing one variable and leaving all of the rest of the variables fixed to some, some number. OK, so this will be part of our analysis. And then let's now think about uh, it's not going to be easy to draw because it's kind of back in the surface. But if we go, I don't know if I can, if you can really see that. Um, okay, so all I've done is I've, I've kept now, I'm staying at x naught and I'm changing the y naught to y1. And maybe that moves me to this point up here on the surface. And maybe there's kind of a, maybe it slopes up a little bit to get there. Then this thing is like a, uh, let me draw it down here, df dy, the delta x, delta y. So now here we've kept the x variable constant. We've just wiggled the, the y parameter a little bit. And it's going to be f at x naught, y naught minus f of, now we leave the x alone, and we change the y a little bit to y1. And now we're measuring the change over the this other variable, y. And that's all we're doing. Like the way the way to think about this, and so this is, this is pretty abstract at the moment. So let me put a put a magnifying glass on this little region of the surface here and just kind of like zoom in on it. So what happens here is that you know if I'm an ant, you know, imagine walking around on this this surface. Um, the surface is telling me something about something I care about. You know, it's, it's a function measuring something about input uh, parameters. If I zoom in on the surface, you can start here. And I'm just looking at, uh, you know, maybe I can go in the y direction, maybe I can go in the, the x direction. So this is like y direction, this is the x direction. And I know, like, I, I'm an ant on this surface, so it's like it's really flat near where I am. But I know that if I go a little bit in the x direction, I just want to know, like, am I going downhill? Am I going uphill? Um, and if so, like, what's what's the incline? And same thing with the the y value. If I instead pivot and go in the y direction instead, am I going downhill or am I going uphill? And if so, what's the incline? 
And so you can imagine like if this was some, uh, some cost function or something like that, that was measuring revenue or something, like you would want to find all of the places that are, uh, oops, you would want to find all of the places that are like highest on it, like maybe something up there. But you might also be interested in like what are all of the, the lowest, just depending on what your function is measuring. So the way I think about this is that if you're an ant and you're looking for the highest or lowest place, okay, what are you going to do? You're going to like look in one direction, you're going to measure the slope and the incline, you're going to look in the other direction, measure the slope and the incline. And let's say you're going for the highest, you're going to compare those two measurements and you're going to go whichever way increases your height the fastest, right? If you go one way and it increases your height by one foot per minute and you go the other way and it increases your height by 100 feet every minute. If your aim is to get to the top of the mountain, you're going to go with the trail that's 100 feet per minute, increasing altitude. Okay, so that's at least like some some sketch of the, the sort of geometry that's going on in the background. You won't really have to worry about this for this assignment, but it's just to kind of contextualize it. Um, I'm going to work through kind of what's happening in, in the example. And in this case, we're given sort of the, the function we have interest, the function of interest for us. Is something like A. So they just write it as A, but I want to emphasize that it's a function of mass and temperature. If you want to follow along, I am down here at this 5.1 uh, section. or maybe just slightly above it, just five. So this is given to us by some equation. In this case, it's like E for M, E to the C, T minus 270. And this is supposed to be some analog of this uh, generation time for the zooplankton. It's somehow the thing that the study is, is most concerned with. And then we go out and we find some constraint. We write, remember from, or just looking at this, this first equation, it depends on two input variables. We're not going to be able to analyze it so easily, so we're going to cut down the dimensions. We find this other equation to do that for us, where it depends on the same input variables, but it's a different, uh, different formula. something like that, 3m squared e to the negative b, t minus 270. And just a heads up, when you're doing your analysis for this, you'll want to say something about, uh, so one of these functions is increasing and the other function is decreasing, uh, a little bit like we saw in the, um, in the quiz question. Um, so you might want to start, you know, at this point graphing things and seeing like what's the point of intersection, maybe try to figure out why is this function increasing versus decreasing. Um, things like that. Okay, so step one, it's going to be to solve for M. After setting well, A will be some, some number. P will also be some number. So we'll have this function A depending on M and T, but instead of regarding it as a function, we're going to regard it as some number A. It's going to be our first step. And you could either, you, I mean, you could plug in A at this point, but if you're thinking about doing this on Desmos or something and you want sliders, it's good to do the, the algebra completely abstractly at first and then plug in A at the very end. Uh, so you want to solve this for E or for M rather. So maybe I won't say too much about what goes into this, but we end up getting something like this. The process for this ends up being like multiply both sides by E to the negative 
c times t minus 270. That'll cancel out this uh, second, the c in the first equation you're seeing, and put a negative one on the other side. And then I've just rearranged. OK. Um, and you'll do the same thing for p. And this one is going to be more complicated. We're going to play the same game where first we thought of p as a function, which takes the inputs and outputs. Now we want to change our mindset and think of it as a, a number. And we want to solve for m. And well, I'll have to leave it to you to look through the example to see this um, how this is computed. It takes a couple of steps, but you end up getting something like, uh, how did I write it? Uh, so I wrote it slightly differently, but should be equivalent. Well, you know, it is it is equivalent. So, so I think the way they've they've written it in the handout is something like uh, p over three e to the <clears throat> B, T minus 270, all over two or something. Um, but all I've done is just pull out that factor of uh, one half in the exponents, remembering that square root is the same thing as raising to the half power. And there's a little bit of a choice here, like you had to choose a plus or a minus, but here we're using the physical consideration of the situation um, uh, thinking of this as representing mass to restrict ourselves to only positive masses. Okay, so you'll have these two equations. And maybe I want to think of these now. So I have M. Now, instead of thinking of it as a number, we can think of m as a function of a and t. And similarly, take this one. Let me call this, this is a different function. Let's call it m1 of a and t. Let's call this function m2 of p and t. Okay, so that's like the, the next sort of perspective shift is that we've, we've thought of things as numbers, we've solved for things, one in terms of the other. Now we wanna shift our perspective back and think about the mass as a function of A and T. Maybe what we'll do is restrict A to be an actual number. So that'll kind of bump this down from being a function of A and T to just being a function of say T. We'll do the same thing with M2. Instead of thinking of it as a function of P and T, we'll kind of fix the number P. And we're just gonna consider this to be a function of T. And now we have two things that we can compare because this is, both of these are outputting the same sort of value that we're interested in. Uh, in this case, it's mass. And both of them depend on the same independent variable, uh, temperature. So you can do some kind of plot of these two. So this will be the M axis. This will be the T axis. And let's see what happens. You get, uh, let's do an orange, this one. So this is a decreasing exponential. So it's something like this. And the other one is an increasing exponential. So it's something like this. And you can sort of plot them together. Um, for this part of the analysis though, what I think you'll wanna do is um, now split it up into two sort of parallel analysis analyses. 
So two parallel so on M one and two. Okay, and maybe let me just say in words what you're going to do here. Um, for M1, you have it as a function of A and a function. So there are two parameters kind of floating around. So there's this A parameter and this C parameter, which will have been fixed to numbers at some point to make this just a function of, uh, like there's some estimates for these numbers coming from the research paper or something. Um, but what you might want to do is see how sensitive it is to those uh, inputs. So maybe you will change. Uh, let me let me write it down in the table first. So let's say M one depends on well, a bunch of things. Uh, so it looks like let's see so A C and T. And is there something else? No, I guess that's it. So I think what you'll want to do here is essentially do some kind of uh, plot of uh, how did I want to say this? So you want to do some table of if you're changing, let's say a a little bit. And you get some change in M1. Uh, you, can, you can think of different ways to organize this data. The idea here is you're just going to wiggle these parameters around and see what the, the outputs, how the outputs change. So maybe you start at something like plus or minus 1% of whatever your original value of A was. So if your original A was 100, uh, you might change A to 101, you might change A to 99, you're going to get two different graphs out of that. So you might want to just put those two on the same graph along with your original A. So one, let me draw this out. Let's see, our original uh, M1 was this orange thing. like M1, first one. And so if you change A by 1%, maybe you'll get some slightly different, uh, it's not so visible. Let me try this. So if you change A by 1%, you might get some slightly different um, graph like that. Uh, if you change A by minus 1%, maybe you'll get some graph like this. And you just want to do some analysis of like, what is the change of output when you fix so one is just plotting these, these different graphs. If you change A by 1%, if you change A by 10%, try to sort of plot these in some way that makes sense and try to think about like, how are you telling a story to your reader about how these graphs change depending on the input parameter. Um, and you might want to also like fix a T value, like say, you know, here's, here's one, or sorry, fix a, yeah, so I guess this is, should be clear, this is a, T down here, this is an M down here. So fix some T value, say T naught, and kind of look at what happens to it on these other graphs. And that'll be what your, your delta M's are for uh, comparing the, the outputs, right? So here on this green line, you'll get some M. Here on this orange line, you already have some M. So you look at the difference of the, the two M's when you change that, that A value by 1%. And then maybe it's not so, um, uh, it's like maybe it's not so meaningful to compare the actual numbers of M 
like maybe you don't want to say it went from 560 kilograms to or 560 grams to 575 grams. It's maybe more useful to do this in relative terms. Um, so this should maybe be like plus or minus some question mark percentage might be an easier way to go about this or a more clear, you might tell a more clear story if it's in relative terms. So you'll do this on M1. And then you'll basically play the same game. So now, same thing. With, so we changed the A parameter in M1. So now we can think about changing the C parameter. So we can do delta C. And delta M1. Again, this is just notation. All this means is that you're changing the C parameters by a little bit. It's good to have these as a slider or something. And over here, you'll get some kind of plus or minus question mark percent. And in both of these cases, maybe you'll do this for some interesting number of percentages, maybe four or five. So maybe you do like 1%, 2%, 3%, 5%, 10% or something. Um, just use measurement of how the output's changing. So this is all for like M1. Well, and then you just keep going. So maybe, maybe you also do this with maybe with T2. So this is more like the usual, if you do it with T, T is more like an average rate of change. So this is more like the usual thing you've seen. So you do all of this with M1 and then repeat with M2. essentially all of the same stuff. So you can organize this in a couple of ways, but I would try to keep it, like have, have some, some method or uh, do it in some systematic way. Either do all of the variables for M1 in some order and then repeat it in the same order for M2, or like do M1 and M2 and just wiggle the A parameter on both and compare the, the two M1 and M2 and then go to the C parameter and then do M1 and M2. But and somehow you want these to be like two sort of parallel analyses. So I'll leave it up to you to sort out uh, some way to organize that. Okay, so vary these things in some systematic way. You want to compare the graphs. Here is what I think is one of the maybe the most important piece of and any, any piece of mathematical or technical writing that you do anywhere in college is that there, there should be a story behind it somehow. Or maybe I'll ask what's, what's the story? So at the end of the day, um, I don't know, just having a bunch of equations and graphs and calculations and stuff in front of your eyes, and even people that are professional mathematicians. Um, you know, it's, it's not the most meaningful thing uh, in the world to just be staring at a bunch of things like that. Um, just remember that it's like it's actual humans reading your mathematics and you're, the, the audience that you would be pitching this to is um, someone who has never seen these calculations, doesn't really know this analysis, um, but they're kind of interested in you know, what is the result of this analysis? What is, you know, some kind of story they're trying to extract from it? Um, and to some lesser extent, like what, what are the methods you might do to reproduce that analysis for yourself? And so the story here is, is something like, we have to go back to our original question of why, why were we even looking at this in the first place? It's because we wanted to know like what impact do these variables have? If I change, or sort of which, which input variable has the most impact? So as you're looking at these graphs, you might want to start you know, telling the reader a story about like how, like what kind of conjecture you're formulating here. Like, are you seeing that if you vary A, you're seeing a lot of change in the output, in which case maybe you're thinking A is kind of the, the more important parameter in this setup. 
And again, to kind of hark back to why we were looking at this is because, you know, uh, it could be that these equations are given to you um, as a paper or something like that, and you're on the theoretical side, and maybe there's an experimental scientist going out and repeating repeatedly collecting this, this data or whatever. So the problem is, is that there's some error in the data you collect, like it could just be, uh, you know, some, some instruments have a built-in sort of margin of error, like a scale, for example, has a plus or minus, you know, whatever it is, 1% or 0.05% or whatever uh, margin of error. Um, uh, you, you can imagine anything that you're, you're measuring could, right, could, it could introduce some error, you know, it could be you know, the weather changing on different days changes the electromagnetic frequencies in the air and it throws off your equipment just a tiny bit. Like, who knows? There's a zillion things that can happen. Um, but so we want to know which which variables do we have to be careful about? You know, like if, if a tiny change in A produces a huge change in the outputs, well, then we should be really, really careful when we measure A to not introduce a bunch of error because even a slight amount of error is going to change our conclusion drastically. Um, and so how might you act on this, right? This is where you might like, uh, you know, ask your department for uh, better measurement devices, or you might like, if you have some grant funding or something, you might say, well, here's the, the most error prone or most impactful um, measurements. So we're gonna spend a lot of money on some really expensive piece of equipment to measure that super, super accurately, because we know we need to for this experiment to be accurate at all. So that's at least kind of where, where this motivation is coming from. Um, and you should sort of try to, to weave that through your analysis a little bit, um, to sort of hint at the reader what, like what, what is the result, what is the conjecture, what is the data actually telling you? Sorry, I just realized there's something in chat. Let me just double check. You just randomly pick a T value to fix. I think that's that should be fine here. Yeah, going up up to this this graph here. Um, yeah, I think you might be a little bit restricted because maybe there's some, there's you have to do some kind of like domain restriction based on the physical situation, kind of like we did for project one. So maybe you pick a T that's actually meaningful in this problem, like not uh, negative 10,000 or something. But yeah, I think as long as you're picking something, something that's, yeah, that makes sense, then you can kind of pick it arbitrarily. Although I'll have to double check when I go back in. There might it might be, they might say in the handout somewhere like pick a specific value. I'll have to look through. Okay, so this is kind of all of part one, and this is the kind of stuff you should be looking at uh, this week. I just want to give you a hint of what happens in part two. So. This kind of is part two. Uh, let me see if I can find these equations again. So we'll, we'll have these two equations that we solve for M. Sorry, kind of scrolling, scrolling all over the place here. Okay, so we have these two equations for M1 and M2. And what we will want to do is take these and set M1 equal to M2. I really, I guess we should be thinking of these as functions. M1 of T is equal to M2 of T. Right, we remember that we have this, this interpretation now of kind of on the algebraic side, setting functions equal um, corresponds to on the geometric side. If we go back up to the graphs, uh, let's see, where are we? Yeah, this one here. Setting these functions equal is exactly asking where this, this point of intersection is for these. And so we'll find that, you know, these are just two graphs and we set them equal. There should just be one point of intersection or potentially zero points. Um, so we'll need to actually find this intersection point. And this will go pretty much like the quiz question where we set them equal to each other and then um, solve one of these exponential equations using methods from this section. Um, 
And so what you will get from this, okay, well, in this case, you'll be looking at something like this, a e to the negative c, t minus 270 equals one third p e to the b t minus 270 one half and what you will want to do here is solve for t And if this, this might be, this might take a little while. Um, all right, so we have two exponential equations set to each other. I mean, okay, first thing you're gonna do is like square both sides for sure. Um, but then you essentially, you can sort of pass that square into the exponent just using exponent rules. And you have something, if I put on uh, math goggles, what I see here is something that looks like e to the negative ct or something like maybe e to the negative 2ct equals roughly, so I'll just put approximately e to the bt. So I'm kind of ignoring all of, all of the, uh, the constants and parameters that are floating around. Um, and if I just kind of Put on the, the rose-colored goggles here. This is what I see. It just looks like two exponential equations being set equal to each other. So we kind of know that we can sort of hit both sides with a log. This is going to move the t's down out of the exponents, and then we can just solve for it. Um, but of course, there are more details that go into that. And in that case, you really do have to track the, the exponents and the constants and everything. But this is just some indication of like what technique would you apply to this problem where I see something that looks like an e to the t on the left hand side and I see something that looks like an e to the t on the right hand side. So logs are probably the, the way to go. Okay, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just say what you get from this. So you can have some idea of what it looks like. So it looks like you get, I'm just going to write this in kind of a weird way, but maybe I'll save some space. 540C plus 270D plus two natural log root of P thirds or maybe it's three over P. And A outside of the root. And there's going to be something in the denominator, which I'm just going to write in this way. The negative one to indicate that that's uh, downstairs. And I missed a friend. There we go. So you get some, some function of uh, so it'll involve A, P, C, and B. So this depends on A, P, C, and B. So this is another another time we're just keeping the the variables set to these abstract letters is kind of a nice nice thing to do because then you can kind of trace out where they go in the equation when you solve it for T. And now when you want to go to analyze this function, you can make this these four variables sliders in your function and you can just really easily generate a lot of graphs that way. So a little bit of hard algebra work, but it saves us a lot of um, uh, replotting a bunch of functions with a bunch of different numerical values. <clears throat> and what you'll be doing there is sort of similar analysis. Of now it'll be a delta 
T as you vary A, delta T as you vary P, and so on. This is going to be the same kind of sensitivity analysis where you're going to have and maybe start off with like a table. We'll have the delta t's. I'm sorry, so t is the output now, so it's the dependent variable that should go on the right. The a's are the inputs. So maybe you change this by plus or minus 1%, and you get a plus or minus some percent change in the output. And so remember now that this is this is where that high dimensional surface picture comes in handy because we have a function that depends on four variables. So I can't even draw it this time. The first one only depended on two. And I was lucky because two plus one is three. So I can I can visualize a function of two variables and its output, a third in three dimensional space. I'm okay. Uh, but this is four input variables and one output variable. So this is like something living in five dimensional space. So we have no chance of like actually um, visualizing it in this level of generality. So this is the kind of um, algebraic analysis we have to do to kind of get a handle on what that crazy high dimensional surface actually looks like. And we're really asking the same question in, in this crazy surface. Um, the outputs are now T values, so these are temperatures. And we're asking, okay, there's kind of four different directions you can go. There's an A direction, a P direction, a C direction, and then some other B directions, these are somehow intertwined. And you're just asking if I move a little bit in the A direction, how much does my T value change? Is it uphill or downhill? And if so, like what's the incline? So same, same sort of analysis. And you're just gonna do this with, so same thing with delta P, delta T, maybe plus some graphs. If, they help tell your story. So again, in this, in this project, you have a little bit more leeway. Um, like it's not, sorry. Um, it's not as set in stone for this one, like what you have to include in each, each section or anything like that. In this one, I'd like you guys to focus more on, you know, once once you've done your analysis and you've reached your conclusion, this should be, so you should kind of do two drafts. So I'm not really requiring a second or, you know, a first rough draft or anything like that. So I think it's maybe just too much ex extra work, um, you know, doing this, like submitting and grading and doing feedback and all of that. Um, but in terms of just writing anything in general, I think it's very good to have a rough draft and to do the analysis um, as like one chunk of your project. And then at the end, you should do a second re rewrite of the entire thing. Um, so you're actually organizing all of your analysis in some way to like have some kind of narrative to it. So I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Is part two kind of just like a different way to do part one? Because um, you said we could kind of do it one at a time, like the change the variables one at a time instead of doing that big long equation with like all of them, because I don't think I could really do that. So could we also just do this the long way? Um, let, me, let me see, I think. Yeah, so the first part like, yeah, you definitely have to include this kind of analysis for the first part, right? Where you have the two different equations and you're just like for M1, you're only changing A and C and separately for M2, you're changing B and D. I'm trying to see if there's, yeah, I think, I think somehow so this, this section in the in the handout, the 5.2 analytic solution, I think it's, it's really just like a, a separate analysis where you have to combine them all. Okay. Yeah, I think, so do you think it's, would the issue be doing this, this um, solving this equation here, do you think? 
Yeah, I would probably need help for that, but I can just worry about it when I get there. <laughs> That's no problem. I think what I'll do then is I'll try to work through the derivation of this, and then we can go through it uh, in class on Thursday. And yeah, so that, that, should, that should make it a little bit easier to follow, I think. Okay, thank yeah. you. So we, we can go over that in, in class. So maybe I'll make a note down here at the end. So for this, uh, solving this. So we'll go ahead and cover this in class. Okay, zoom out really quick just to make sure just a quick quick recap on kind of what we should be looking at between now and Thursday. So try to, to meet with your uh, your group partner or partners, um, preferably between now and Thursday, because you'll definitely want to start on this, um, this first section here of just doing this analysis of writing these equations, solving for n and plotting them. Um, what I would do at this stage is maybe start making a bullet list where you're kind of outlining your project and like, what do you want the sections and subsections to be? You don't have to start writing it, but kind of do a, an outline draft. Um, we'll cover a little bit of what goes into part two on Thursday. After that, you should probably like actually do this analysis, you know, report it down in like a first draft, something like that. And then at some point you should plan to meet up with your, your partner again to do a second uh, draft where you maybe um, use all of the, the tables and the graphs or um, the analysis you did from your rough draft, but kind of organize it in a way that, um, you know, frames, frames what is your conclusion and how does sort of each section or subsection of your project, um, like what is it telling the reader about your conclusion? Um, so there might be like a, one, one narrative you might go with here is that, you know, as you're looking at the graphs, you might have some conjecture about which one is influencing the outcome more. And so you might hint at that through your paper, like, oh, here in this graph, we're seeing that as we change A, the outputs in N change quite a lot. So maybe A is an important variable. All right, now that I think about it in, yeah, so part one is really an, an analysis of the changes in mass as a function of the input parameters. And I think part two is actually now kind of flipping that and it's saying, now let's look at the change uh, in temperature as a, as Near the input parameters. Since we know mass and temperature are two things that go into um, this like generation time that we're concerned with. Okay, so I will go ahead and let you guys go. Please, yeah, just feel free to write down your questions or email me or bring them to class on Thursday. And good luck. I'll, 